we're going to do now is just have a look at two cases and just go through them with a focus on our clinical reasoning process and our decision making process. So case one, we have a 45 year old female who presents with a 24 hour history of epigastric pain. So the patient reports that the pain, gradual onset, very severe, burning, aching in nature. The pain doesn't radiate anywhere. It's constant. It doesn't appear to be affected by movement or position. She's had several vomits as well, though, but in the absence of diarrhea and there's no reported fever. A systems review is unremarkable. There's been no recent foreign travel, no ill contacts, no history of trauma. There's no past medical history or no regular medications, minimal alcohol consumption and a non-smoker. And again, no significant family history. So we've got a, a reasonable history there. So let's just pause for a second and just think what are the potential differentials that we need to consider? What's likely but also what's serious if we miss it. And so there's a, there's a table there, loads of different differentials that I think are all entirely reasonable at this stage. But frankly, there's far too many to, to consider, too many to investigate at this stage. We need to go and do an examination to try and pin down which, which we think are the most likely. So when we examine this patient, we notice that she's overweight and she appears uncomfortable. She's sweating, but is a normal colour. Sweating is always a bad sign in the patient. If you've got a sweaty patient, that basically means they are unwell. So examining their respiratory and cardiovascular systems there they're unremarkable and the abdomen is soft but with significant tenderness to the epigastric area with some localized rebound tender tenderness and guarding murphy's negative the bowel sounds are present um, observations are there so slightly high heart rates slightly high respiratory rates so that's saturating well with a normal blood pressure and a low-grade pyrexia there's a bit more information there and i think what we need to do at this stage because we've, we've already got that list of 15 or so potential differentials is pick out some of the key features from the history and key features from the examination that we can use to pin down what we think our, our likely differentials are. Look at the patient demographic details. So age, so she's middle-aged, so she's not a child, she's not elderly. That's an important feature that might point us towards some of the things that we'll talk about later. Um, she's female, um, but she's got no past medical history and she's slightly overweight. So potentially risk factor for, for certain diseases there. Now if we look at the problem specific information we know she's got epigastric pain which is constant i.e it's not colicky but it's very severe associated with vomiting no radiation of that pain examining her she's sweaty which is a sign that she's actually got significant illness there's some evidence of localized peritonism suggesting a surgical cause and she's tachycardic with a low grade temperature i think it's probably reasonable to to pause at this second and just think what your top differentials would be Number one for me at this stage is probably cholecystitis. This is because of the severity of the pain, the tachycardia with the low-grade fever, the fact that she's sweaty, the evidence of localised peritonism, and the fact that she's got risk factors for gallstone disease. That slightly un-PC collection of symptoms, fat, female, fertile, 40 and fair. Things that would go against cholecystitis are the fact she's not septic and she's Murphy's negative. But for me, I'd put that at number one because actually it's a more important diagnosis not to miss than some of the others further down the list because they can go on to be septic, septic and quite unwell. Number two for me is probably pancreatitis. So reasons for pancreatitis, the severity of the pain, the fact that she's tachycardic, the fact that there's localised peritonism, and that she's got some risk factors for gallstones of these. Points against pancreatitis would be the fact that it's not radiating through to the back, which is a classical finding in, in pancreatitis. But again, it doesn't exclude it. So that's why it's quite high up on our list. So number three for me is bilirubin colic. So again, you've got the risk factors for gallstone disease. You've got the severe pain. The things that push you against bilirubin colic is the fact that the pain's constant. It's been over 12 hours. You, the bilirubin colic pain is typically sort of three to five hours and then it, it settles. Now number four for me would be something like a reflux, something you know less sinister, but but possible. So she's got the severe pain, it's epigastric in, in nature. There's some mention of it burning in the history. Things that would put you against the, the reflux though would be the localized peritonism and the sweating. You don't tend to sweat with reflux. So I was saying that the last time I had some reflux, it was after a, a beef madras. It was a very nice beef madras, but I was also sweating with epigastric pain, which turned out to be reflux. But that, that's that's different. That's the exception rather than the rule. So I think we can ignore that one. Number five for me would be acute coronary syndrome. And I think mainly because it's important not to miss. Females in acute coronary syndrome often present a little bit atypically. So if she's having an inferior myocardial infarction, this may well give some epigastric pain, um, which would be quite severe in nature. Things that go against that, though, are the, the localised peritonism suggesting a, an abdominal or a surgical cause and the lack of any significant cardiovascular risk factors. So she's not diabetic. She's non-smoker, no hypertension, no family history. And then finally at the list, again, one that's important not to miss would be a, a perforation 
features for this, the sweatiness, the severe pain, the tachycardia of the low-grade fever, the evidence of, of peritonism. But things that go against that is that she's not overtly septic and she's not got any generalised peritonism. So those are my differentials. And then we need to use those differentials to inform which investigations we're going to do. So from a bedside test point of view, we can get a 12-lead ECG. That's very quick, very straightforward. And we'll help exclude an acute coronary syndrome. Blood test-wise... We've got a list there that we want to do. So full blood count, looking for infection, use and ease, CRP, again, looking for infection. Liver function tests, which can look for evidence of liver pathology, either intrinsic liver pathology or any cause of cholestasis, so any obstruction to the to the liver. And amylase, obviously for, for pancreatitis, some centres will use lipase. A coagulation, which is a key marker of liver intrinsic function. Venous blood gas is fine, always helpful when you're when you're managing unwell patients, and it will help determine the severity of the illness and may impact management, i.e. if they've got a raised lactate, you're going to consider a more aggressive fluid resuscitation. Blood cultures, I think, are reasonable. You've got a low-grade fever. There's some evidence of peritonism, which suggests either a degree of intra-abdominal sepsis or the risk of developing intra-abdominal sepsis. So I think some blood cultures are entirely reasonable at this stage. And then when we're thinking about imaging, the only thing I really want to do at this stage is an erect chest X-ray which would help identify a perforation, which is, again, low down on the, on the differential list, but quick, straightforward test like the ECG, just get it done. And from an emergency medicine point of view, she's not unwell enough that we need to be overly worried about getting in some urgent imaging, but we're probably going to be thinking about that further down the line after consulting with our surgical team. I'm going to create an initial management plan. So obviously we're going to give this lady some analgesia and some antiemetics. The key questions that I'd like you just to consider for a second would be, do we give her IV fluids? Do we give her antibiotics? Do we consider a PPI or an antacid because reflux was on our differential list? Or do we consider aspirin and GTN because they're on our differential list? And again, there's no right or wrong answer here particularly. So for me, I would wait for an ECG before describing aspirin or GTN. The PPI or antacid, I probably wouldn't go to because I think it's the low down on my list. And actually missing it doesn't cause too much harm to the patient apart from pain, which we hopefully should be able to manage with other forms of analgesia. The IV antibiotics... I think are entirely reasonable at this stage because there is some evidence of localised peritonism. There is a low-grade fever suggesting potentially early infection. And alongside that, I think the IV fluids are appropriate based on the same reasoning. Although other clinicians may well withhold antibiotics and fluids awaiting blood tests. But just for me, I think when you've got that early evidence of peritonism suggesting potential intra-abdominal sepsis, I'd rather get the antibiotics and fluids on board early. So then going back to those investigations that we've requested, we've got a normal ECG, We've got a venous blood gas with normal parameters apart from a lactate, which is 3.8. So anything over 2.5, we tend to get worried about. Anything over 4, we tend to get a bit more worried about. So 3.8 suggests that she's unwell, but not too unwell that we need to be thinking about high levels of care. Her hematology there, white cells are slightly raised, but everything else is, is pretty much fine. Biochemistry, raised CRP, liver functions there showing a more obstructive picture with the significantly raised outcross to ALT. Although the intrinsic function of the liver looks okay, so the INR, the bilirubin and the albumin are all normal, suggesting that the function of the liver itself is fine. Then we've got an amylase of, of 1600, which is, which is quite raised, which would be in keeping with the diagnosis of pancreatitis. And then finally, our imaging that we took, the erect chest x-ray is normal with no evidence of pneumoperitoneum. So actually, then if we go back to that original list of, of differentials and use those investigations to influence that, obviously that's going to change our order. So now pancreatitis moves to the top because we've got the raised amylase. The cholestatic picture from the LFTs suggests some, some obstruction, and most commonly, certainly if you've got pancreatitis, this will be due to a gallstone. So actually, as we went through that case, we saw that our differentials changed as additional clinical information was added. And that's what happens in practice. You clerk a patient, you see them often without any investigations back. You base your investigations on your initial history examination and those initial differential diagnoses. Once you've got those investigations back and you've completed that initial management plan, you then reassess those differentials and do they add up? So let's look at case number two. This was an interesting case I had. So it involves a 75-year-old female whose husband called 999 due to a collapse at home. And when the paramedic arrives, the patient reported feeling dizzy, then having a collapse, and feels dizzy essentially when you sit her up or stand her up. So very postural. There was a brief reported period of loss of consciousness for several seconds, 
but there was no limb jerking, there was no tongue biting, there was no urinary incontinence. There was no chest pain prior to the collapse, and no recent symptoms reported by the patient, although we're made aware of the fact that she had a recent CT thorax abdomen pelvis about a week ago because she's been having some dysphagia. So that CT is looking for evidence of essentially an esophageal cancer, plus minus metastases. So systems review reveals that she's gets short of breath on climbing flight of stairs for the past few weeks as well, but otherwise is unremarkable. So at this stage, again, if you just want to pause and just think, what are your initial differentials based on, on that history? Obviously, they're going to be quite broad, like we had for the first case. But there's some clear prodrome there with the feeling dizzy, then the collapsing. And obviously, or well, the assumption is she's got a significant postural drop. So that's commonly due to dehydration or sepsis. So that needs to be on, on our list. Other things to think about, potential cardiac collapses. There's no chest pain or palpitations prior to the collapse. But she, as I said before, she's clearly having some postural elements. So is that due to poor pump function? The shortness of breath on exertion that she reports in the systems review. Is that due to heart failure? Is this due to a possibly a valvular problem? So she's getting poor out put from possibly aortic stenosis or something like that, that that's affecting blood flow to the brain uh, something like a pulmonary embolism always need to consider if patients are collapsing with any sort of shortness of breath or respiratory symptoms reported and also to throw into the mix that there's a potential background of, of a cancer which makes you pro-thrombotic uh, we always need to consider seizures but again there's no the history doesn't really fit with that so there's no limb jerkings no tongue biting no incontinence no real post-ictal period so i think that's that's unlikely but again important not to miss so if we move on to examination then, we notice that she's peripherally cool, shut down, but has a good central capillary refill. She's got normal heart sounds. She has a clear chest on examination. No peripheral edema and carved soft non-tender. She's got a soft and non-tender abdomen. And GCS 15. She's got no focal neurology. Her observations are a little bit striking though. She's just tachycardic and a heart rate 120. Blood pressure sitting is 80 over 40. Laying her flat, the blood pressure is better, 95 over 50. Again, just suggesting a significant postural element. Respiratory rate's quite raised, 28. But SATs are okay, so the SATs are 94% on air. And temperature's 37.7. Now again, if we just pause, does that impact our differentials in any way? And I think the answer is probably not. So sort of sepsis still needs to be up there. We've got the low grade temperature. We've got someone who's hypertensive, got a raised respiratory rate. Could this be chest sepsis? Things that would put you away from that would be that she's got a pretty clear sounding chest. She's got normal oxygen saturations and there's no real history of any infective symptoms. Is something cardiac reasonable? What we talked about, is this potential heart failure or is this a valvular problem? We can't hear anything from a heart sounds point of view. It doesn't Again, it doesn't exclude a valvular pathology, but it means it's less likely. And we can't hear anything on her chest, so we can't hear any evidence of pulmonary edema. She's got normal saturations, but again, doesn't exclude exclude that. But you would expect to find some clinical evidence if she's that hypotensive. Pulmonary embolism, for me, I think that the pulmonary embolism should go much higher up the list now. She's significantly tachycardic. She's hemodynamically unstable. And actually the sepsis and the cardiac cause appear less likely based on our clinical examination. And then seizure, again, I think is even more unlikely. We've got no evidence of neurological deficit. So I think we can go ahead and discount that. Which then asks the question, which investigations do we need to do? Bedside, an ECG would be helpful. She's tachycardic. A potential cardiac collapse is in our differential, so that's going to be helpful. Blood test-wise, we're going to want to check a full blood count. Use an ease and a CRP, which will help with our infection markers. A D-dimer, I think, is indicated because we're considering a PE as part of our differential. Venous blood gas. So a venous blood gas is important for our sepsis 6, and again, will help determine how unwell this patient is. Blood cultures are indicated as well, just in case this is sepsis. And then imaging wise, I think a chest x-ray is obviously going to be helpful just to see if there's any large abnormalities in the chest that we can pick up on clinical examination. But I think that will do for an initial set of investigations. And thinking about our resuscitation of this patient, what are we actually going to do for her? She's hypotensive, so IV fluids in a bolus. I think IV antibiotics, again, at this stage are helpful just in case it is an early sepsis. You've certainly got enough markers to suggest the sepsis picture. The question for me, though, at the time was if this is a PE, it's obviously a large enough PE to be causing some hemodynamic instability, which always shows up the question, should we potentially thrombolize this patient? So after we'd done that initial management, I had a chat with our radiology colleagues, and then we went for a CTPA just to see if there was a large embolism there. Unfortunately, there wasn't, and there wasn't much in the way of consolidation or infection in the chest. What turned out to be wrong with this patient is that she had a pericardial effusion, which turned out to be malignant in origin. Now, that obviously wasn't on our differential list at the start because it's a very rare diagnosis, very unusual diagnosis. And I thought I'd include this case in the clinical reasoning video just because it highlights that point I made right at the start, that clinical reasoning is not a science. It is essentially a best guess. And even though the 
the process, the clinical reasoning process is correct. You might not end up getting the right diagnosis. You might end up getting a different diagnosis to another clinician. So I think just to summarise then a few key points. So clinical reasoning, as I said, is the, the process of using clinical information to create a diagnosis and a management plan. It's not a science and it is essentially a best guess based on previous experience, based on weighing up probabilities. Beware cognitive bias and how it impacts our decision making process. Try to stay methodical, try to use the evidence. And I think remember that process of collecting information, being thorough with your histories and examination skills to make sure you're collecting enough good quality clinical information. Make sense of that information in the context of the patient, using that information to create a differential list or problem list and constantly test those differentials as new information is gathered. Don't be scared to change your diagnosis around. Don't be scared to admit that you don't know what is going on with the patient. And if in doubt, get a second opinion, get a senior opinion early. 